This episode of the Wedding Film School Show is brought to you by Musicbed, the best music licensing platform for wedding filmmakers. Head over to themusicbed.com and enter our code WFS on checkout to get a free month on your annual wedding subscription. Now, on to the show. It was scary. It was like a sink or swim. It was kind of like, this has to work, and I need to be extremely intentional and precise with the direction of where I wanted to go from the very beginning. I knew the target market that I was trying to hit, and it was clear to me what I wanted it to be. I wanted it to be high end. I had a, a graphic design degree background, so fashion or other successful high end brands, what are they doing right? What kind of typography are they using? Your customer that you want knows if you're a good fit just by looking at you from a, like your logo. It, you have to challenge yourself to get yourself out of the box and it's going to feel uncomfortable and just know that that's going to be the case. Hey guys, welcome to the Wedding Film School show. It's me, Jason, and I have a special guest today, Kyle Smith from 87 and Smith. How you doing, Kyle? Doing great. It's good to be here. Yeah, it is good to be with you. You know, it was kind of an unexpected treat, but Kyle, uh, well, I don't know, it was like Monday or Tuesday. He was like, hey, I'm going to be in town. I want to come by the studio. And I was like, that's awesome. Um, Kyle's a good buddy of mine, um, helps out with some wedding film school stuff, but also just somebody appear in the industry. And I was like, I would love for you to come. And I secretly plan to trap him with a podcast. <laughs> and so now we're going to do a podcast. I'm ready for it. Let's do it. Let's go. So, so what are you doing in town, by the way? What are you doing in New England? Shooting a wedding. Newport. I love Newport. Rhode and Island. actually, I think I'm shooting with you. Yeah. Yeah. You're so going to help me out. Yeah, we're going to be shooting uh, in Newport, Rhode Island at, at one of my favorite venues. Um, Which is? Rosecliff. Rosecliff. Uh, really beautiful place. And we're going to have some fun. But before that, we're going to do a podcast. And so we're going to be bringing back our segment. We haven't done this in a long time. It's one of the most challenging, I think, um, barrages of questions any artist has ever had to endure and so i hopefully you can stomach it kyle but it's called three questions i'm ready you ready okay here we go the first question we always ask and and i think it's the one that um you probably will be the most comfortable with is tell me what's in your kit what are you what are you shooting with these days i like to keep things simple so oh, i don't have a lot yeah sony a7s3 those are my go-to cameras. And almost all my lenses are Tamron. I have 28 to 75s, 35 to 150, 70 to 180, and a 20 or 17 to 28. I like that. That's all the focal lens. So I've got everything. So the second question here is, tell everybody about a wedding that you've shot that you feel really represents 87 and Smith and your work, something you're really proud of. Yeah. Um, probably one of my most recent ones that I've done. It's, I think it's funny because I think a lot of my videos are different. Uh, each one, like I don't, they don't all look the same. I think each one represents the couple and like their personality and their story. Um, so it's hard to find one that represents like exactly who I am because I feel like I'm represented in a lot of them. But one that I'm really proud of is um, ironically another Rhode Island wedding. It was in Watch Hill. If you're familiar with where uh, Ocean House and all that is. Um, it's a longer film. It's like nine, a little over nine minutes, but it kind of goes on like this journey with a couple. It's like a mixture of creative shots, storytelling, um, and just uh, describing who the couple is. And uh, it's on my website, but um, I don't so, know. It's just it's also going to be on really... the screen on yeah. the podcast. So if yeah. you're listening and you want to see the footage, you can head over to the Wedding Film School Show YouTube channel and you can mm -hmm. see some of his beautiful work. So the last question that I want to ask you is, oh, being honest... What's the longest you've actually ever spent editing a highlight film? Oh, this might upset some people because I'm a fast editor. So I think my longest is probably, you want like hours? Yeah. 20? 20 hours? That's the longest you've ever spent on a highlight? Yeah. You should work for me, dude. Yeah. You could edit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting that you bring up just such a short window for your longest edit because i feel like that's totally on brand for you in terms of like 
clarity of what you're trying to accomplish. And I think that's really interesting. And so we're going to get into the interview now because I want to get over just some of that stuff with you, kind of how 87 and Smith is kind of zero to 60 and since 2019, really. And But before we talk about that, how did you get into filmmaking, Kyle? So it started in 2014. I was working for another brand at the time. It was local to the D.C. area. So that's where I kind of got started with filmmaking in general and also wedding filmmaking at the same time. So I don't have any previous experience doing films and getting into the weddings. It was just like from the get-go was wedding filmmaking. Um, and I became a lead editor and shooter for that company for like five years up until at the end of the 2018 season. Um, and then beginning of 2019, starting my own brand. And so 87 and Smith is relatively new in terms of existing as a brand, but my experience is goes further than that. Yeah, so. yeah, for sure. So, so as a filmmaker, you know, one of the things I have enjoyed about watching you kind of with the brand and I think I got to know, I definitely knew you in 2019 online. Um, and I remember thinking like, oh, that's a cool name. Mm. Oh, that's a cool name for a brand. And then I looked at your work and, and I was like, oh, he's, he's, he, he's got like good taste. You know, I could tell that you weren't like a noob and that you were, there was something you were after. And so I think what's interesting about like what you've always set out to do, or at least what I've seen is like, there seems to always have been like a plan. Like how much of like, when you got started with your own brand, like was, first of all, was that like a scary transition or was it like, Oh no, this is the exact right time I'm out. No, it was scary. It was like a sink or swim. Um, I, I left the other company knowing that like I had reached as far as I could go with it. And the next step was either I have to find a new job or I'm going to do what I know how to do well and just do it on my own. So it was kind of like, this has to work and I need to be extremely intentional and precise with the direction of where I wanted to go from the very beginning. Yeah. So, yeah. So what was like the vision? Like this is what, this is what I want to get into because I look at this all the time with people and this is one of the biggest weaknesses of wedding filmmakers. We're not really the best at branding. Mm. Like, I think like we're technical, but a lot of times in terms of communicating visually with our own brands, it's pretty weak. Yeah. And, and it's interesting to me when I see people who get it because they seem to just skip a bunch of steps that other people have. Because the customer isn't as perceptive on like experience, or even though you had a lot of experience, but they are perceptive of like brand language and, mm -hmm. and all that. So, like, <clears throat> when you got started, kind of what was like the the way that you were thinking about your brand? Because I would love to help somebody a little bit. They're starting their brand, or they're rebranding, or they're thinking about how they want to communicate. Mm -hmm. How are you thinking? Because I, maybe I should ask this first too. Um, right now, yeah, eighty seven and Smith. How many, like, what's your average sale, do you think? Um, Price. This year, averaging, like, 7500 Yeah. And, and how many total weddings are you aiming for every season? Around 18. 18, 20, and then you end up doing 24. Yeah. Like everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you're running this robust, very solid business in the middle of a pandemic mm -hmm. now in a and, 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 do you think like the branding was such a big part of this, like your brand vision, your brand, yeah. like what was the original like concept when you're like, I'm going to start 87 Smith. I knew the target market that I was trying to hit and it was clear to me what I wanted it to be. I wanted it to be high end, not like the extreme high end, like celebrity style, but like people who are spending on average, like a hundred grand or more on their wedding. I knew the, the money that DC has in terms of, I understood what my market could provide. Um, because I had already had that experience in the wedding, in that, in that market, in the weddings already, I knew what was capable. Like I knew that the money existed. I knew that the clients were there. I already had a relationship with the planners at that point who had those clients that I needed. And so it was just a natural progression of kind of what I was familiar with. And then now it was like, all right, now this is my baby that I have to create and build. And this is the clientele that I'm familiar and like comfortable with. Um, and so just knowing that my, my customers and my couples were um, successful adults, they were 
they either owned their own businesses or they were attorneys or lawyers or in politics. Like they were just refined and, and mature people. And so I think my brand had to reflect maturity, um, classiness. Um, and so th those are the th things that I considered. I had a, a graphic design degree background. So I think just like my, my, not like expertise, but like, I just understand art and how it all works, like with the brain and people perceiving things and understanding what, where they find value in things and brands and like taking ideas for, from fashion or other successful high-end brands. What are they doing right? What kind of typography are they using? What are the words that they're using? What, what's the imagery look like? How does it feel on the website? And so taking all those things and putting it into my website to, to attract those same people. So it's the, it's the whole thing with like identifying who your ideal couple is and like give them a name and an occupation, like understand who that is. I kind of skipped that step because I already know who that is. Just I didn't. There's a lot of things about your business that are really interesting in that regard because it's like in some ways you started a new business and in other mm -hmm. ways you didn't. In other ways you just like, I always hear this is like, it takes five years to have a mature business. Yeah. And there's, and there's a lot of reasons for that. It's like, you don't know what you're doing. Mm. You have to fail a lot. You have to learn the industry. You have to learn your partners. You have to learn all, and like, you got to do that on someone else's dime. And then- Which I'm very blessed to have had that because yeah. I know many people don't. And so like, I think, and sometimes I think like, I, I took a shortcut to where I am, but I also recognize that it's been no, you a, didn't. You, spent, you put in the time. <laughs> you put so. in the time. And I will say this, like a lot of people don't have the humility to do that. And I think like we, we, we have an epidemic in our industry of just stuck up arrogant people who don't realize that like there is a such thing as apprenticeship. Mm. There is a such thing as learning. Like there are people around you that can help you. And every time you see people who are willing to like be humble and actually like take their time and also like fail privately. Yeah. Like, that's the thing is if you fail and you're working for someone else, that person takes all the bullets. Mm -hmm. Like, you fail and you're running your own thing, like, that's you. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think, like, you were lucky, but also, in some ways, you just, your process wasn't that much different than other people. And that's why I think it's interesting to bring up the previous, because some people will hear it, and, like, if you just say, oh, I started 87 Smith in 2019, and now I'm making, like, over 200K. Mm -hmm. They're like, What? Well, I've been sense. doing my business since 2019, and I, 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 like, no, you had the planner relationships. You're in an urban area on the East Coast, which we're in the East Coast, too. It fetches a lot more dollars than maybe some other parts of the country. And I will tell you this, like, we weren't running the business we were running until five, six years in either. Mm -hmm. And then you stick with it. You do the right things. You work on the brand. Like, so I think it's really interesting. So so you have this idea, 87 and Smith. You have this client you want. Um what about the shooting side? Because I think you have a very distinctive look. Um, how much of that was a kind of targeted at that customer and how much of that was kind of you just saying like, this is what I like and I'm gonna do what I like. Or so the second one. <laughs> <laughs> how would you describe your look and like what you're trying to communicate in like visually and with your camera actions and all that? It's a good question. Dark oh, and moody, would dark, you, do you I, like dark no, moody? No. <laughs> <laughs> People would describe it as dark and moody, but I don't think it's really that dark. Um, it's just not light and bright. So it's more like natural. Um, and my look, and you can agree, I mean, it's changed. Yeah, uh, I, I was telling him off, off camera, I was like, I remember when he first started, I remember thinking, he has some cool ideas. He doesn't know how to color grade. Yeah, yeah. And I would be the first one to tell you, I, 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 color grading was my weakness. Um, I think it still is. Um, but I do get, and a lot of people well, comment people like and it. people like it because so, it's, oh it's unique. It stands out. I, here's what I'll describe your look. I don't like dark and moody, but I will say high contrast. Oftentimes like you will gravitate towards like hard light, mm -hmm. like shadows. You do like, like creating moods and contrast and like not, not overly, um, ethereal, not overly feminine, yeah. but like a. I guess that's a, that's a good way to put it. Kind of like a more masculine kind of feel to it. Very but, professional. Yeah. Like it's something that 87, a person, say there was a man named 87 and Smith 
it looks to me like 87 in Smith. Then I did a good job. Yeah, that's that's how I'd say is like it reminds me of that character. Yeah. You know, and I, and I think I think if you look at it, you're like, okay, this is part of the brand aesthetic. Yeah. Like, it, even though I think you said you did what you liked, I look at it and go like, well, yeah, but also you did what complemented the brand. I don't know if that yeah. was on purpose though. Yeah, I think I think the two kind of evolved together. Um, the biggest inspiration to me in terms of how I choose to expose shots and color grade is kind of like, I want it to feel more like a film than than a video. And I know we talk about that a ton in the industry about like what's a film, what's a video, is there a difference, is there not? And to me, like a film, when I say film, I'm talking about more like movies and cinema. Places with controlled light. That's Places, what that means. Yeah. And they're, they're always shooting from the dark side and the, the highlight and the light's coming from the opposite side. So I'm trying to strategically place my people in positions where that makes sense or position myself where against the light on the opposite side. And so the way that I color grade maybe is a little bit darker because like movies and things that I enjoy are a little bit darker lit. I mean, if you watch the latest Batman movie and it's like practically shot in the dark and I'm not that dark, but like that's the stuff that I enjoy. And I think people are drawn to that. And so when they watch the film, they're always like, this didn't feel like a wedding film to me or, or a wedding video. It felt like a movie that I was in. I'm it like, really is after. about like using light to isolate. Yeah. subjects which forces you to look at the things that the filmmaker wants you to look at like yeah. real filmmakers control light and use it as a focal like point for the viewer like they're like look over there that's their eyes look over yeah. there it's this table look over there and i feel like um that when i watch it i'm always like yeah this is what he's trying to do he's trying to get you he's trying to control the viewer in some ways and get them like that is to me what filmmaking is like cin cinema mm -hmm. Event coverage is everything is well exposed, no matter what. You stand where they allow you to stand. You go where, like, and there's nothing wrong with that style of event coverage because a lot of couples really like it. Yeah. But it's definitely not everyone's look. It's definitely not your look. Yeah. I've never seen one of your shots, and I'm sure you get them. You just don't put them in the films. I've never seen one of the ones where I'm like, he just had to stand there because that's what there was in the room, and he's standing in a bunch of hotel light, and the people are all going, well, about the bride's reaction. Like, that's what my thing is. I feel like there's things that aren't in your film. What are the things that you're like, this is cheesy. I'm not putting putting it in my film. Cake cutting. Uh, I used to always put that in there because I felt like I had to. I was like, oh, it's a wedding film. I have to put the cake cutting in there because it happened. I since stopped putting it in and no one has ever asked to put it in. So uh, it doesn't add anything to the film at all. So I, I leave that out. Um, what else do I do? garter toss all that stuff but i don't know if anyone's even doing that anymore I think you know the a... worst thing the thing i'll ask you this for me the part of the wedding film the part of the wedding day that i hate the most that i wish i never ever had to film is bridal party introductions not a lot of weddings we do don't have those now but there's every once in a while one comes up and yeah. like, it really is about the dj yeah if the dj likes them they happen and I'm always like, why are we doing this? I hate filming this. It's so cheesy. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I don't. I don't usually put those in either. Lately, my last two, they've introduced the whole party at once. Yeah, that's which that is a little bit different. Kind of rather than that like could be the kind of fun. Tedious of like every couple by themselves, but they're just so uh, hard to track their dance moves. Unless, <laughs> unless it was like really unique and cool, I'm not gonna put that in. I feel like there's just a. It's a very small range of things that some people are putting in and then other people put in this huge range of co types of content and i don't know what's better like as a filmmaker if you're just open to everything or if you're not open if you're just like no this is what i do and i'm not doing i'm not diverting i, I wonder like I, I always wonder that it's like should i stick to my guns or should i be flexible and you know like where's that line between like branding and inspiration I don't know. I like to stay open because I think it helps me creatively. Um, but if it doesn't work, I just don't showcase it. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I think there is a weird like thing. You see the debate all the time. Like It's not about you. It's about the couple. Uh -huh. And I'm always like, yeah, but kind of. It is about me. <laughs> kind of. It's kinda, like, it, and, I, and I wrestle with that. Yeah. I wrestle with that because it's like. I mean, I definitely would do something if they asked. Mm -hmm. I think I don't really wrestle with that because it's I like, either. man, whatever. It's definitely not worth an argument to me. But in terms of how you create, 
is it more effective? Is it better for you? Like, like, am I robbing them of something they don't even know I'm robbing of? Right. When they don't even know that I'm like, that's dumb. I'm not putting that in there. And sometimes those things are in the other edits that they get. So mm-hmm. it's like they they have the moment. That's it's just not in the I highlight. Yeah. So, okay. so, for example, I've got a couple that I'm dealing with right now. They emailed me last night about some revisions. And they want more of the dad's speech in it. And... I know some people would be like, no, the the highlight is the highlight, and that's just kind of how it is. And you know, no, I I couldn't find a part of the speech that really worked in the film, so I'm not going to do it. I told her, I said, look, I'll, I'll try and fit something in there. It's fine. It's not necessarily a portfolio film, so like I'm not like stressed about it. But also, if it was a portfolio film, I would just keep that edit the way that I wanted it. Put whatever they want in, give it to them, say here. What I do is just like give it. them the speech. Well, that's the other thing. I'm like, you have the speech. Like, why does it have to be in the highlight? But yeah, I at know. the end of the day, I don't really care. I'm like, this is your wedding. This like, is what people need to understand. If you're new to the industry, like couples have all different reasons they want their film. And some of them are for themselves. And some of them are, this is the craziest thing ever. I might've said it on the podcast before, but I don't know. We talked to this bride and she didn't like certain things about her film. And they were ridiculous things. Like, why is the light so orange? It's called sunset. <laughs> but, but yeah. <laughs> it's like, I don't know if you've ever been outside. It's called golden hour. It's called golden hour. <laughs> it's an hour where the light is golden. <laughs> and everyone else like would kill for this light. Yeah. But regardless, the thing that she said that made me go like, oh my gosh, people are demented. She's like, I don't think that if people watch this film that, that didn't come, that they're going to be jealous and miss that they didn't come. She wanted the jealousy factor. She wanted people to watch her film. And instead of thinking, wow, they love each other so much. People are so amazing. She wanted them to think, why wasn't I there? I'm so mad (laughs) that I couldn't go to that event. And I was like, that is, but like people have all different things they want in their film. And some of them are like, for me, I want to show it off to my uncles so that they can hear my dad's speech in four minutes. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, that is, I think what's critically important is like, yes, your brand really matters. Um, but we're in the service industry first and foremost, and service matters a whole lot. And I do think like walking that line between like knowing what's important to you and also caring about what's important to your customers. It's the industry we're in. We're we're filming weddings. I mean, if it was all about me, then I would do do short films where I control everything, right? Yeah. Control the light and the characters and the story. It's pretty fun though to shoot weddings. It is. It is pretty fun. Like the challenge of it. Yeah. Like, like even like on Friday, I like shooting with my uh, industry people, mm. especially like higher end people. Every time I get to, I almost always try to do it because I always like to watch how they work. And then mm-hmm. I steal their tricks and then try to take Put their, them out of business. Well, and I'm going to try to take <laughs> your leads and all that. <laughs> yeah. No, but, but in general, no, like it's like you shoot for these people and you can see like. A, there's a lot of commonality between the top people. If you're doing really well, most of the people I work with that are doing well treat their customers and the other vendors the same. Like, I've never worked with someone who I wasn't like, okay, that is to me the big difference. If you're like listening and you're like, oh, three years he did this. Well, of course, he had five years experience ahead of that. Yeah, uh, that's definitely contributed, like you said. But I, the other thing I know is I'm going to sit down with you or we're going to go shoot this wedding and that planner is in the what in the photographer you're going to interact with them the same way I would the same way a lot of other people who are at the top of the industry would how do you think what do you think is the thing that helped you the most when you were learning the industry like not how to be a good filmmaker not how to be a good editor but the industry the way the industry works we were talking before like wedding planners are essentially like a social club right and you learn these things and you learn like don't step on certain people's toes and What was the biggest thing that helped you when like you launched 87 and Smith that you were like, you felt like it was a cheat code from your previous experience in weddings? I think it's understanding um, your role in the wedding day and knowing how to interact with people appropriately. I think it's understanding social cues. I think it's, I have like a customer service background that extends past weddings. Um, and so just being able to interact with people the right way without coming across as like cheesy or annoying and obnoxious or fake or fake. Yeah. Um, so being authentic 
and being a pleasure to be around, I think is a huge thing because people want to be around people who are easy to be around. I mean, it's just natural, right? There was, for example, a wedding that I did several weeks ago and the photographer, they were so obnoxious the entire day, but they thought they were doing everyone a favor by being like joyful and bringing life to the day. But it was like, everyone's looking at each other like, who are these people acting so extra? And I think that's, it doesn't play, it's not, it's not giving them any favors, I don't think. And so I think it's just a knowing how to present yourself in an area of people. I mean, some of these people are, I mean, they're affluent people. So it's not necessarily a crowd that I'm around every day in my normal life, but on the weekends I am at these weddings. And so I have to know how to present myself in that type of crowd. And when a planner can see that, oh, Kyle knows how to present himself in a crowd that this is a million dollar wedding and there's celebrities here or there's high, there's politicians here. Like I'm not causing a scene. I'm not like, it's just like they can trust me to behave essentially. Yeah. I think the, the thing that I do um, coaching sessions and, and then I was talking and I mean, I always mention him on here. I really respect Lindsay Conklin from the ref. So I do too as an artist, but really as a business person, as an educator and, <clears throat> So, you know, he's one of the people I would talk to in terms of like considering, and I was talking to him the other day about like hey, coaching people and we're talking about like when you talk to someone and, and like you ask them like, they say, oh, what do you want? And they say, oh, I want to become this type of filmmaker. I want to charge this price. Um, you know, there's branding things that you can usually say, oh, your branding sucks. Maybe you should up level up the branding. You know, your films need to get a little better. Like, most filmmakers are very interested in being good filmmakers though. Mm-hmm. Like, to be honest, um, too interested, more interested. They do, they put a huge emphasis on that. Even though, you know, I, I think that's kind of the easiest thing to at least get to like a certain level to is just shoot a little better. Yeah. Edit a little better. But then where they the wall up and ha- hits is I'll say something like, well, tell me about where you want to work. Like, where are the venues that you want to work in your area? Like, what's the hot? You're, you're telling me you want this type of customer, which maybe you don't really want, by the way, but you think you do. Mm-hmm. This, you know, you want this customer who spends this much money. Okay, well, let's talk about who has that kind of money. Like, me and you, I think we almost have the exact same customer, by the way. Doctors, lawyers, politicians. Yeah. People who appearances matter. They, um, you know, of, of course, we get some people who don't fall into that category, but primarily it's True. like middle class to upper middle class wealthy-ish people people who are used to being perceived a certain way the women don't want to be seen without their makeup on a lot of times like they're professionals they have an image to maintain and they're not like the type of people who are like oh let's go on a crazy adventure right you know every once in a while i'll get a couple like that too but in general it's like i know who my customer is and you ask this person, like, tell me about the customer in your market who makes that kind of money. And they have no idea. They have no idea who in their area makes that type of money. They have no idea the planners that service that customer in that price range. They don't know the photographers. Mm-hmm. So you ask them, what photographers do you like in your area that you really want to work with? I don't know. It's all about n- knowing how the industry actually works. And, like, I would say this. I, I don't know if this is actually true of you. But I would, if I was to analyze how you were able to jump, I would say, you know how the food chain works. Sure. Like who eats first in the in the the savanna of deserts, mm-hmm. or of of weddings? Who eats first? And it's like it's not us. It's like wedding planner. It's like mm-hmm. venues, wedding planners, photographers. Like they're killing the big game. Yeah. We're just eating the scraps off the. <laughs> yeah. And it's like so you know if you want to eat you got to follow around the tigers and the lions. Yeah. Making strategic connections and relationships with those people because you know, that's where the the referrals are going to be coming from. Yep. And it's, it's actually much easier money. Easy. Way easier money. Like, like I, I have planners that will send me, Hey, can you, uh, I'm just going to send you eight contracts. Yeah. I, I, I signed, I think one day, six contracts from the same planner without speaking to the couple one time. Signed the contract, got the deposit. Yeah, email. Literally four words. Are you available on this day? Great. Yes. Done. 
Over. Send me a contract. Okay, well, who's the name? Well, who? Where is it? Yeah, and don't get me wrong. There are some things with that process that I'm like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. I need to. I need this out of the couple. Sure. Need, like we're we're we don't just like. But essentially, it, it, it's very simplified. Yes. And that's what I that's what I like. But that's the only way to get that. Yeah. Is like I don't think you can like. If there's a filmmaker out here who's listening, who's like, no, I have, I'm getting fifteen thousand dollar contracts, and but I need to be very connected to my couples. It's like, so you shoot eight weddings a year, fifteen grand average, and you are one of ten mm-hmm. who probably do that. Like, and it's all in I don't know Iceland or stinking like some national park. Like, that's great. There are people like that that exist, rich people yeah. who also are outdoorsy and want to do this type of wedding. But most rich people, most rich people who you can reliably generate a $7,000 contract out of, most of them are corporate. Mm-hmm. Vast majority of people, like people who are like making over a quarter million dollars a year, they're not professional YouTubers or bloggers or. I don't know, action sports people. Yeah. <laughs> like, they're, and, it's, and I think like I'm all for you doing whatever you want. If you want to take like, I'm, sh- I'm sure he does plenty of, I mean, no, I know he does plenty of normal-ish weddings, but if you watch like films by Stanton and you want to like shoot that type of elopement film and, and make that type of wedding and inspired by that, of course, and they're beautiful films. He does a great job. And there are people like that mm-hmm. who want to buy it. But I think what you and I, kind of identifying is like we were like i don't want to say it's the path of least resistance but it's like you know we wanted to have healthy thriving businesses that generate a certain amount per sale sure and we were like this is where the money is yeah and i feel like when i think about like how did he do it i'm thinking like well he knew already what was available in the industry he knew the food chain and he was able to just he didn't waste his time like on all the wrong stuff he already knew he already yeah. was educated on that i mean one of the big things i did in the beginning was reach out to a planner and say do you have any couples this is the first thing i did when i established my brand was and she's doing like huge weddings right now but she's still one of the biggest ones in our market and i said do you have a couple that did not have video this year that i can come i'll do it for free because i knew that there was a value in connecting myself with the planner and there was a value in her clients because she does all high-end clients. And I was like, I need to have a portfolio that I can showcase, that I can do these high-end events. And she goes, I absolutely have one. Yeah. Come out, come out here in July. Cool. It was a private estate wedding. She was The bride was a model. Like, That's how I got started. And I was like, yeah, I didn't make any money off of it. But I got more weddings from it, and I established my portfolio, and people were coming to me and like, couldn't believe like your your brand is only six months old or the very first wedding i ever booked we did photo and video so keep that in mind but we it was a sixty five hundred dollar contract nice and it was at castle hill in newport and it was off of (laughs) one free wedding i said to someone like does anyone know any good looking people that are getting married i just was like i didn't know anyone in the industry i knew nothing about weddings yeah but i i just knew how to i knew about branding and so we just went and got the best looking person we could find and shot a free wedding. It was wicked extra. I think I shot like four different times with these people. Did all these interviews. We did all this. It was super extra. And we went to this crazy wedding show. And we way over pre- prepared. And, yeah. and like we were there. And like then this one rich person walked. And this is what I want. The reason I tell the story for like the hundredth time is like your customer that you want knows if you're a good fit just by looking at you from a like your logo. Yeah, logo's huge. They're just looking, and we had these giant banners and one film playing on loop, and the film was not high end. Like I think the the uh, reception was in like a VFW hall. It's actually one of the most low end weddings I've ever been a part of. And she's like, "Oh yeah, you're the only person that's like at all classy. We're coming from out of town. Um, we, we're getting married in Newport. Three days. We're gonna take a boat out. Blah blah." And I was like, "Sure, yeah." And that and then like, we we immediately were introduced to that kind of market right away because we put out the, in the image. Um, yeah. So you've been doing this and I think you've kind of like probably made a, a turn at least in the last like 18 months in terms of even another level. Yeah. Like how have you, 
I re- we went to engage together. Obviously, that was fruitful for you. But in general, I think even just in your local market outside of engage, like what's been the biggest thing that you feel has kind of helped you like even turn the corner into like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm fully booked and I'm providing for my family to like I'm beating people off with a stick in some ways. I'm I well, have all the things. Don't I be can fooled. I, I'm still hustling. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh I, I am entertaining every lead that comes in because I'm still, I'm still small. I'm a, I'm a small brand in terms of like longevity of being around. So like, I don't have the luxury of having all these past clients that are sending me referrals. So, which is, it's probably the case for a lot of people because there a lot of people's brands are five years or younger and they're still working on that. But, um, as much as I feel like I have experience, I'm still like any time. There's times when there's crickets in my inbox. I'm like, is anybody getting married? Like, um, good thing you have all those connections. I know. I mean, that's the thing is like, like, I would tell you, you should maybe not have crickets. And I always tell people, do whatever it takes. I know you will, you know, but I think it is interesting is like, if you do a good job with the relationship side, when the marketing side isn't going crazy good, right? You know, you're going to have something. Yeah. You know, I mean, the big thing, I mean, recently, like what's, I think, putting me an intentional move that I've made recently, which I think has opened up doors to opportunities, which you've noticed I've been coming out to Rhode Island often and like this north, northeast side more. I Before it was just like the D.C. very localized market, but I'm trying to expand my reach um, just through natural opportunities. Like I'm not like putting ads out in Boston to have me come up here, but like they just naturally happened. The one that we're shooting uh, in two days was a referral from a bride that I shot her wedding back in like 2016 or something like that. So it was a family friend of hers. So that's brought me back out here. But uh, honestly, like Instagram has been huge for me and me seeking out, like we talked about, we understand the food chain. And so I'm trying to seek out the planners and the photographers that are doing the work that I, I want to be doing and who I want to be working with because of not only their clientele, but also their look too. Cause I want to make sure that I'm with somebody. Well, that and also related to that, one of the things I see people do is they're immediately going to go like Marcy Bloom. That's who I want to work with. I'm going to yeah. talk to Marcy Bloom. It's like Marcy Bloom does not want to work with you. Marcy Bloom is not going to work are, with you. Yeah, yeah. And she so doesn't I think need you. <laughs> if you're after this luxury space, you have to understand that there's like... Less than 25 filmmakers who are servicing the And top. they're in the market, and you're not going to get yourself there by DMing Marcy Bloom. Or hey. even going to engage and talking to Marcy Bloom. Right. It doesn't work like that. No. However, the people that are just below her and mm-hmm. doing like the high end, you can you can get in with them. Or the person in your market... The- thing I think is the best and you already mentioned it without even maybe meaning to is the person in your market who's gonna be maybe not Marcy Bloom but they're gonna a rising star a rising star those are the people if you can become essential to them they will take you up with you to the top I know it and I that's what I've been doing there's a photographer in Detroit who does some of the most beautiful work I've ever seen and she has like 500 followers, some a super small amount of followers. She's charging like three grand or something. And her work is insane. So I connected with her on Instagram and I was just like, I like some of her stuff, sent her a DM. I always send DMs and I say, Hey, uh, I just want to let you know that I really love what you're doing. You're putting out incredible work. Just thought you should know, keep doing it. Something like that. I keep it kind of short and brief, but I stick it to the point. And that's authentic. It, and that's authentic. And then she responds. She's like, oh, my gosh, thanks so much. Like, you do incredible work, too. It would be awesome if we worked together. Of course, she likes my work because I found somebody who kind of represents what I'm doing and the look that I'm after. So she's automatically connected and interested. So she follows me. And then I go to her grid, and I see that she's working with this certain planner regularly. Okay, what's this planner doing? Well, she's doing the kind of weddings that I want to be doing because she's using this photographer. And then come to find out that the, the planner is super, like, high-end weddings but like does not have a large footprint at all like maybe a thousand followers on her page but she's doing stuff all Which over those the country. people actually exist there's a lot of people who are doing super high-end events but don't care about certain they're parts. not on lists they're not they're not 
they're just doing their thing. They have so a I client connect, you want. They have, yeah. So I, I connect with her. And that opened up the door to my highest paying wedding, which is just over 15 grand later this year. Yep. And that's how I got in. It was literally through Instagram DMs and being authentic and making connections that way. And then that connection is going to lead to something else. I've made it on the planner's close friend list on Instagram. So like she sends me like personal stuff and like. You're it's, having a plan and intentionality behind your well, brand and your look. And I'm I think, 35 years old. I'm married. I have a kid. Two kids soon. I have to be. Inten- I have to be intentional. Yeah, yeah. And also, like, you have to be developing that. I I say this story a lot too. Is one of my favorite movies is Euro Dreams of Sushi. It's a documentary, very DSLR. <laughs> it's like early, back when that was like the yeah. this new innovative thing, and it's about like I think the only at the time, the only three Michelin starred sushi restaurant in the world, or at least in Japan, but I think the world at the time. And it's in uh, like a subway in Tokyo. It's a sushi chef. I think he was in his 80s. And he has all these mentors. And at one point they're talking about like developing a palate and developing good taste. And he's like, well, in order to make good food, you have to eat good food. Mm-hmm. So they all like they're always tasting, they're always going, like they're developing their palate and their their like repertoire of ways of describing food, thinking about food. And it really kills me sometimes when people say, oh, I don't watch writing films. I don't watch other people's work or I don't watch films or I don't watch like kind of just like I don't need anyone else's input. I don't need external input into creating my look. It's coming from me and I'm the best. And I'm like, are you though? Because, like, no one I know that's any good says that or thinks that way. Like, everyone I know that's really good, maybe it's not wedding films. I do think watching wedding films is beneficial because that's the industry we're in. And I like to at least know what my competition is up to. Yeah. But at least, like, having, like, a strong aesthetic sense and, like, becoming a more interesting person. Mm -hmm. Like, develop yourself. Stop, like... You're not actually enough. You need to continue to develop yourself because someone else is. Like other people in the industry are not doing what you're doing. If that is actually your thinking, if I could adjust one thing in your thinking, it's like, no, you need to be developing your taste because you need to know how to, what you actually did with that person is you said, this is good work. And that, that planner, she does good work. So she wants to work with that photographer who also does good work. And then that planner goes, oh, his work is good too. So what you actually did is collaborated as artists. Right. And I think a lot of people, it's like, why would anyone want to collaborate with you? You're not bringing anything to the table. And you don't even know the difference between a good planner and a bad planner, a good photographer and a bad photographer. So like, you're not going to make it mm-hmm. in that until you start actually developing your palette. And it's like, and I don't mean like, and this is not an insult to anybody. Like, there's nothing wrong with like saying, oh, Jose Villa. Like, of course. Yeah, of course, freaking Jose Villa. Everybody knows Jose Villa is good. Yeah. Everybody knows Pin Weddings is good. Everybody knows Sculpting with Time is good. Everybody knows KT Mary is good. Why? Why is Ray Roman good? Why are these, why, did, why are they successful? What about their work is good? Oh, it's, so, there's, I see it a lot. And it's old, and they've been around a long time. Why have they been around a long time? They've been around a long time because of something they're doing either in their work or in their profession. You need to know that because those, if you have the same traits, Mm -hmm. you might get to work with the same people because they are looking for Ray Roman light or, you know, Peyton Frank light or, you know, Yoni da Silva light, you know, same aesthetic. You got the same vibe. So why would you not want to watch Yoni da Silva? Right. What if your work is the same? Like I would say, he reminds me, like similar to kind of some of the stuff you do, would be similar to kind of what Yoni, Yoni does, except his certain his perspectives is, and yeah. and his looks and stuff. But I'm like, I feel like that would be your dream client. Yeah. I know that. Why do I know that? Because I watch his work and then I watch your work, and I'm like, you don't want sculpting with time. You want Yoni to sell this client. Yeah. But and it's like I have a palette. I know what I know about the industry. I know about clients. I know about couples. I know about photographers. I know about like, just do that. You have to know. You, you got to know. know. It. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, kind of like, for you, as an artist, like, if you were to be able to, like, what's the next 
thing? Like for you, when you're developing your art, like what's the next challenge for you? Making shorter films. Ah, tell me about that. <laughs> okay. I I don't put a time limit on my films when I whenever I make like a when I book a, a wedding. It's just a highlight film, and I used to do like a, the typical five to seven minutes or eight to twelve or whatever it was, and then sell them at different price points. But I did not like the fact that a couple would buy the longer edit and the the wedding just didn't have enough content for me to to offer something that fit that timeline. I was like, I hate feeling like I have to drag things out to meet a 10 minute film when yeah, the wedding we, just wasn't we, there. We, we won't sell that unless they do multi-day. And then I started doing, okay, well, I'm not going to do that until they have rehearsal dinner. But some, and then sometimes even rehearsal dinner didn't have anything oh, for me to rehearsal use. Rehearsal dinners are pretty much garbage. <laughs> like, let's be honest about that. <laughs> sometimes they, they hit, sometimes they don't. I would give it one out of 10 are good and the rest are just dark. The terrible. best thing about rehearsal dinner coverage is the price point of which I, I book one. So if they want to book me, that's great. I make a ton of money off oh, that. Oh, yeah, me too. That's great. So but I'll do that all day. Content. Exactly. <laughs> um, what was the question? How are you? Oh, oh. You were uh, saying making shorter, shorter films. films. So I, just, I said, I'm getting rid of all the times and I'm just going to offer a highlight film and I'm going to make it however long I want to. If it warrants a 12 minute film, I'm going to make a 12 minute film. If it, it can, if I can only do a four and a half, I'll do four and a half. But I can do whatever I want and nobody can say, oh, well, you promised us it was going to be seven. That's that's one of the worst parts about wedding filmmaking. So, so it's been working great for me, actually. That's great. But what's weird is I did it because I didn't want to do these long edits because I, I felt like they were being forced and I wanted to do shorter ones. However, now that I have an open end, the average of my film length this year has been like nine minutes. Hmm. I'm like, what is What am I doing? And I, I, I think there's a, I need to figure out how to make things a little bit more, huh. See, more punchy. I want to be more punchy in a shorter amount of time rather than like, I kind of have a slow editing technique. Like I like using longer bits of toasts that tell a story, but in order to do that, I have, I have to have enough time to do that and then get to like other things in the wedding too. Whereas some people just like they grab like little five second sound bites that like somebody said and they can kind of chop through that. But I like to have like this. It's it's like feeling. Uh, you want the context. Yeah. Too. I, I think. But sometimes I, I can get a little bit. I can get too much into it. Well, I, it's interesting because I remember listening to David Lynch, director of like Eraserhead and Twin Peaks and mm. one of my favorite directors. And he was talking about like limitations. And he was saying like the actual genesis of creativity is limitations. Like if you have no limitations, you will not be creative. You will just do whatever it, you, it's, it's too easy. So I would say maybe you have an internal limitation and see what happens. That's what I'm doing on yeah. this next wedding. Yeah. So I'm going to say, this is going to be, I think I'm going to say it's a seven minute film. I've got so much, I have so much footage. Yeah. And that's what I think is like impressive because I see sculpting with time. And they're they have these highlights that are so impressive. And I'm like, how much stuff? Did well, but they what not they're include? doing, I mean, obviously, I you know, knowing Alex pretty well is like they're selling a teaser. Yeah. They're selling a four minute or five minute film. They're selling a fifteen minute film, and that's why they leave it out. Oh, I got it. Mm -hmm. And I think I think it's because they have like the structure. Yeah. A, they're charging for each of those edits. They're making a ton more money on the deliverables, and then B, they're able to leave it out because they have another place to put it. And I yeah. think that's the struggle with some people is like, obviously many of us are selling only the one film, maybe right, a teaser. Right, right. Yeah. It's not abnormal. And if you can't consistently get couples to buy the longer edit, which many, like we have a $10,000 package and most couples just can't afford it. Like we might sell it 6% of the time, Yeah, you know, um, plenty enough to be interesting, but, not enough for it to like most people don't want it we know that they don't want to spend it uh we maybe i don't really care so much like it's easy for me to get five minute at it yeah but um i can totally understand what you're saying you know it's like you know there's a better film in there or you know like certain things deserve more time yeah because there's been I, i've submitted to the film review and some of the criticism i've gotten is like this is just too long 
for me. So yeah, well, and then I sit back. I'm like, you know what? Like you're right. Like it is too long. It uh, it's too much slow mo footage, and it kind of just stacks on top of each other. And all of a sudden, it's just like, oh, okay, golly, like I've been watching this thing for too long. I think so, you have to always like that trip. Pin, you got to punch people in the face a little bit with dynamics. Yeah. And like a film can't ever like the nature of what we're doing is montage. Yeah. We're making music videos yeah. essentially. Everyone's like, oh, I do a music video style. I do documentary style. I'm like, all of it is music video style, guys. Just, they're like, oh, it's, what I love in our industry is I wish we could eliminate doc edits in the way they use it. Like, I will see new people and like, okay, I just made an, I said a person the other day say, I, I just made my first film, two films, the, a nine minute edit and a 58 minute edit. I'm like, 58 minutes is not edited. You literally, so you're giving them a t- toasts? Like you made a fifty-eight minute, a little bit of B-roll, a fifty-eight minute export, the full mass Catholic ceremony. Yes, like a little bit of c- c- cocktail B-roll. <laughs> it's just like Toast. that is not what, but that's not a documentary. If you watched a documentary and the guy was like, oh, "I'm doing this documentary on this volcano," and then he just arrived at the volcano, <laughs> it's walked like up the two mountain. hours of just a clip like this, <laughs> or like his actual walk up the mountain for yeah. two hours and then yeah. pointed at the volcano <laughs> and then walked back down. Yeah, that's. No, documentaries are edited. Yeah. It's just about how documentary, docu- documenting is about a style of coverage. It's not about a length of film. Yeah. And I don't get that. I'm always like, this is not a document. If you, if I watched a documentary that was just a straight hour long ceremony, that's like a, an event. That's like the, we don't go like, oh, I watched this documentary last night. What was it called? Oh, it's called the Oscars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's like no, I watched, I watched a, a live event. Yeah, yeah. And it's like event edits is what we call them, or linear edits. Yeah. But I look at it and it's like a lot of people. Um, I think because they don't value like they they don't sell their stuff right, so like t- selling the event edits that's very valuable to couples. They love it, and you can make a lot of money on that. Like a lot of money selling speeches and toasts and all this mm-hmm. crap. And the I think most people should be covering their stuff to deliver linear cuts. Like if you were, if I was shooting with some people, I'd be like, stop moving during the, oh, I got to get people's reactions during the toast. No, you need to have a cutaway. Right. So you can sell the toast later when the person calls you and says, oh, my brother's toast is awesome. Can right. I have it? Right, right, right. And it's like, that's the industry we're in. Mm-hmm. One, like straight up. And so there's a place for all that long stuff. To me, the highlights are just about getting that next customer. And the average person I'm sending, like the average person watching your film does not care about that customer at all. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. That's just my two cents on it. I don't know. Like definitely that's an interesting goal though. Cause a lot of people, I think that's a lot of people's goal. Like when you're, when you're actually like kind of trying to, you're trying to go to that next level. It's all about like, can I get someone to watch the full film? That's the problem I'm finding is that like, if you're, if the person watching is not invested in the couple, they're not watching a nine minute film. Yeah. I'm not watching a nine minute film of some, somebody that know. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, if I, if I appreciate the filmmaker, then I'm watching and, and spending time watching their work and stuff. But if it's just a random video online, I'm not watching it. No. So then long. I'm doing myself a disservice because there's stuff at the end that I'm really proud of that I'm doing, but no one's watching it. Yeah. I always tell people, I'm like, your first customer for the first 10 seconds is the wedding planner. Yeah. So can you make the wedding planner like it in the first 30 seconds so they will share it? And then after that, it's like, I don't care if they watch anymore. Like all it's almost I'm... like the, the first the first like intro should just be like a plan, a planner demo reel. Basically. Like and then a, get into the story. That's the style. Well, no, that's why I always like when we do like Huxley film, um, we or our 15 minute edits, I always yeah. tell people it's like the beginning is a teaser. The first 30 seconds of all our f- long films is, is a teaser. Yeah. And, and then, I've done that before where I've made the teasers for the couple because it's what I sold. And then just like, all right, well, that's the intro to the film. And then we just kind of black out and fade into the. Yeah. But like the concept is like, how do I get you to watch the film? That's, I think like. Got to hook them. Who's the customer who needs to watch the film? Well, the planner needs to like it and watch it. Because if they share it, their customers that you want will see who they work with and trust you. And then your next client needs to be hooked enough to watch the film. And if a bunch of filmmakers watch it, I couldn't care less. Mm-hmm. I do not care if filmmakers watch our films. I'm pretty sure no filmmakers watch a Stop Go Love film. I've watched one. Well, yeah, because I'm friends with you. <laughs> like, you wouldn't have ever watched that film. Why would you ever watch that? It's 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 not for you. It's literally highly targeted. Yeah. At my customers, who I want to be the next customer. 
Right. And I think like you got to stop caring about what people think that aren't your customers. Mm-hmm. You know, and I and I do appreciate that. Even if you want to make longer, shorter films, I do feel like you're kind of very much pointed in that direction. So maybe the last question I'm going to ask you: If what's your advice to someone who's just starting out? Like if someone's and like really just starting out, like. And maybe your advice is go work for someone else, whatever. But like they're just starting out and they're getting into the industry. What what is the biggest advice you would give them in terms of how to establish themselves and, as a wedding filmmaker? We're going to have to cut this out. <clears throat> I need some more. I need some music. <laughs> oh, wow. What's the next one? I got to put the crickets one back on. I used to have crickets. And go. It's a great question, Jason. Um, I mean, it's kind of a generic question. It's like one of the most generic podcast questions. You've I ever know. Asked. I don't know. Gosh, there's so many things that people need to work on. Um, I think the biggest thing, what I think what it comes down to if you're brand new, number one, your work's got to be good. It doesn't have to be like mm-hmm. incredible, but it's got to be solid. Yeah. Because... Otherwise, you're not going to book anybody. Um, but I think the most important thing is just relationships and knowing the power of relationships and making sure that it's with the right people. So you got to get yourself in front of the right people and figure out how to do that. So, Okay, so that I hear that advice a lot. Yeah. And I, it's 100% accurate. How do you do it? Or are you, here's what I'd say. You're a soft-spoken guy. Uh, you don't seem shy to me, but you are soft-spoken. Um, would you consider yourself shy? Not shy. No. But like an introvert. But I can be an extrovert like yeah. I have to be. So, and I'm, I would say I'm not shy, but I am introverted. Similar. I'm not soft-spoken, but I am shy. Like in, in the sense that it's like I'm, I'm not like super social. Um, that, that's not something that I really enjoy. Like small talk crushes my soul. Um, but that's the industry I'm in. And so I've had to overcome my own personality. Mm. In some ways. In other ways, I just lean into it um, and just I just interact differently with people. But So there are a lot of ways to skin this cat. So say you're someone who's starting out, and not only are you introverted, but you're incredibly shy. Mm-hmm. And you feel like very uncomfortable. With that. And I'm probably going to ask this question to a lot of filmmakers because it's the thing I keep thinking in my head is when I'm doing these consults, at the end of the – I go through that whole list and I say something like, Who's it? Who do you want to do this? How do you want to do this? And yeah. all of it. And the person will end up saying to me, oh, I'm just really shy. I don't know how to do this. What would you say to someone who's wanting to level up or be established in the industry, who's super shy and introverted, who really struggles with relationships? I'm trying to think of like if I was that person, what I would do. I think... It, you have to challenge yourself to get yourself out of the box and it's going to feel uncomfortable and just know that that's going to be the case. So because I am kind of like more reserved and I don't like, I don't talk a ton going to engage was a little uncomfortable because you've got people who are at the top of their game all o- over the place who all know each other, who all know each other and they're all talking and then their little clicks and groups and stuff. Now, everyone's friendly and welcoming, but you have to jump into a random group of people and just be like, hey, my name's Kyle. What do you guys do? And it's like so awkward. And then you're like, I'm a filmmaker. And they're like, oh, who cares about you? Yeah. <laughs> so it's just like, it's, oh, so it's, you're like no one. Okay. And it was very uncomfortable. But I was like, I've got three days here. I've got to just do it. And it was weird. But. I just, I forced myself and I had to do it and I made really great connections. And then once I did it, I was like, oh gosh, that wasn't so bad. So then the next day got a little bit easier and the next day got easier. So I think you have to challenge yourself to just be like, look, I got to figure out how I, how I can do this. And I think one way to do it, to like ease your way in would be like, create a really strong relationship just with somebody that maybe you're already friends with or, or have a good relationship with. Like, uh, like find a photographer that you relate with a lot mm-hmm. and find a way like, hey, can we go to this networking event together and like have like your wingman person like next to you so that when you go up and talk to people, she can or he can introduce you to this planner and kind of ease your way in rather than feeling like you just have to go in cold. When we first started, we didn't really think of a difference between photography and videography. 
Be- because we both had photography backgrounds. And so the, we immediately found photographers who we liked and we're like, look, can we get coffee? Mm. And it was just friendship. We just wanted to talk about cameras and, and fun stuff with people. And that's why I'm always like th- so thrown off when people are like talk about photographers, like they're the enemies and stuff because we started our business hanging out with like, at the time it was like, you know, Rebecca Hansen and Tyra Bleak. And these people all, they're not even in the area anymore. Some of them aren't even doing weddings, but at the time they were successful and they did a good job and they were doing high end events in our area. And we liked their work and we thought they were cool. Yeah. And so they became our friends and we worked hard to develop. I didn't know any filmmakers till probably three or four years ago, but I know tons well, same. When of I, photographers. When I started my brand, I had no idea. I knew my market. And I knew like the four videographers that lived in that market. Cause I was like, that's just like my, that's my world. Mm-hmm. And then when I branched out, I was like, look, this is my intentionality move of like, yeah. I got to figure out what the world is doing mm-hmm. because I need to be a player in this world. But you probably initially just knew photographers. Oh yeah. And I would tell people, okay, if you're shy, I ain't get over yourself. Cause usually shyness is kind of a, it's actually a lot of times a veiled um, self-centeredness you think everyone's obsessed with you and they're actually not, they don't really care. Like, (laughs) so they're not thinking about you and how stupid you are every time you talk to someone, but also create interactions that are more your style. Find a way to do the thing that you are more comfortable with. So if you're more comfortable with like, for me, I go deep. So I'm not always the person who I'm the person who the planners would call about serious problems and business advice. And I just lean into that. I was at engaged, and one of this lady was like, "Oh, you need to chill." She said that to me. I was like, "No." <laughs> I was like, "That's what Jared is for." <laughs> but then I'm standing, and I'm just being myself. And yeah. then I answer a question in one of the things. Sydney Novetny, who's like a major speaker, who I didn't know who she was. To me, she's no one. Like now she is. She's right. But to me, I was like, "Oh, who's this person?" Everyone there's like, "Oh, Sydney Novetny," and I'm just like, "My superpower is I don't actually care who you are." If you're smart, I like you, and that's what I connect with. And so I, I catch big fish. Yeah. And they're like, she's like, oh, my gosh. I'm sitting in the tub with a, a, a someone. Hot tub. A hot tub. <laughs> yeah, I'm sitting in a hot tub with someone who had been in the big flower fight. Yeah. And I'm telling her, like, yeah. I don't know. My wife likes a show called Big Flower Fight. <laughs> yeah. She's like, stop it. Yeah. You know that that's my show, right? <laughs> and I was like, no, I didn't know that. It's like, but I'm just, like, being authentically myself. Yeah. And, and, like, they're attracted to the confidence and the energy. Now we're not all working together. We're not all doing that, but that's just my style. And it works for me. And Mm. like, I also know there's weaknesses just like if you're really shy, like, you know, you're going to have a weakness. If you are super accommodating and really not shy, you're going to have weaknesses and that will bite you. That's all cool. Mm. But I think you can't let yourself like just be who you are today. You have to push yourself and you have to figure out how to do it in an authentic way. And I think that's really good advice that you said is like, it's gonna be uncomfortable and you're gonna have to, no matter what, like asking someone to get like, you know, you ask your wife on a date when, before she was your wife. Yeah. I'm sure on some level it was a little uncomfortable. Yeah. You're not oh. sure if she's say yes or no, or how it's gonna go. You but. hear about it a lot. I mean, a lot of public speakers, you'll find out that in the, in the, off the stage, they're like very reserved, quiet person. Like this is not really who I am, but I, they figured out how to do it because it's what, they it can, lets them they do what they do actually it. want to do. It, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think it, it's a muscle that just needs to be strengthened, um, and it's not going to come overnight. I think you just got you got to work on it. And it's got to come from you. It's got to be authentic. I think. Yeah. Um, be because yourself. You are, are attracted to authenticity, yeah. right? So be yourself, but also don't accept yourself as you are. Push yourself. Challenge yourself. Yeah. And I think relationships are the much more I think challenging developing relationships than developing your filmmaking skills Mm -hmm. because that's probably whatever you're comfortable with you're probably comfortable with the camera you're probably comfortable in the edit bay privately alone for 60 hours a week that's probably your safe place and this industry the wedding industry is not the production industry it's a it's an industry that's really weird and it's (laughs) driven by a very small group of people who make all the decisions and there's micro industries too so hey kyle I really appreciate you as a person, of course. Um, I appreciate you coming on the podcast kind of impromptu. That was kind of fun. Yeah. And I think you had a lot of good stuff to say, and I loved your perspective. 
Appreciate being here. Yeah. So if you enjoy this podcast, definitely subscribe, um, whether you're on the podcast platforms or whatever it is. If you're watching on the YouTube channel, The Wedding Field School Show, it uh, means a lot to us if you would comment, if you like, if you, uh, as I say, smash the like button. Don't just press it. it. Like, totally smash it. Um, and also um, share this with people if this was good. And, of course, check out Kyle's work, 87smith.com. Is That's that? right. Yeah. Uh, check him out on Instagram, all those places. Show him some love. Do it. All right, guys. Have a great day. Peace. Good job. I like